Well, praise the Lord, everyone. Good morning, good morning, good morning. So happy and glad to have you joining me today. We're going to get into the Word, give everybody just a couple of seconds to get joined in here. And as you do so, um, I ask that you go ahead and share this with your friends, share this on your Facebook page, share it on your timeline. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm excited. Glory to God. We're going to let everybody kind of pop on here first. Got a couple of announcements and I, that I, want, I want to make real quickly, and then we're going to get into the Word. Hallelujah. Amen. Let us know as you sign on. Hallelujah. Amen. Give us a happy face. Give us a, give us a thumbs up. Let us know you're there. Hit the like button. Don't forget to share it. Amen. Praise God. Well, it's kind of a gloomy day here in Southeast Louisiana. I'll tell you that. Somebody, somebody need, 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 needs to pray and have this rain to stop. This is getting ridiculous. Amen. Praise the Lord. When you cut your grass and your push mower is cutting ruts in your in in your lawn, that's an issue. I'm sorry, that's an issue. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Well, I want to especially start off this morning by thanking everyone for watching last week. I got called out at the last minute for work last week, and so we put up one of our older, one of our one of our previous messages, and it was actually it's one of my favorite ones. I appreciate my I appreciate Apostle Barber doing that for us, and I just appreciate having having your support. Amen. I also want to thank the men who came out with us yesterday. We um, journeyed over to the West Bank of Jefferson Parish to help out an old friend of mine. Um, a pastor whose house burned down back in January, and I didn't, I'd heard about the fire, but I didn't know the circumstances behind it, and um, long story short is, he, he didn't, he, he was, un, he was underinsured for the value of the house, and so he is in the process of remediating, repairing, and rebuilding the house so that he can go ahead and sell it, Amen. Um, it's just, it, and it was just a time of fellowship with the men that other men that were there. And we also, um, talking, talking to Pastor Jonas afterwards, we put him about three weeks ahead of schedule is what he told me. Um, so that is a blessing. And if you, if you've ever had to done any, ever had to, been in that situation before, I had to do that type of work. Getting getting ahead of the curve is always a good thing. And he was so appreciative and so um, blessed by what we did. And I want to thank the men who came out with me um, sat yesterday on Saturday. Okay? And our ministry opportunity was what it was. And it certainly ministered to him. Amen? Praise the Lord. So we were able to be a blessing. We met some other brothers in Christ. Had a chance to fellowship. Oh, but we worked our butts off. It was hard work. Okay, it was hard work. It was dirty work. But you know what? It was a good time. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, let's get back into our study. We're talking about thoughts. We're still talking about thoughts. Now, this has kind of went into a teaching about the kingdom of God. Okay, but we're still focusing on thoughts. And so as I begin this message, I want to go back and read our foundation scriptures that we're using, okay, very quickly. So we're going to cover a lot of ground this morning. So get your notepads out, get your ink pen ready, get your pencil ready, and let's get ready to get into the Word. Amen? All right. Okay, in fact, let me do one thing here because I need to make sure I preach long enough for you. So let me get my, my timer started, and I'm going to have to govern myself because I may not be able to get through everything I want to get through today concerning this portion of the message. Okay, and you know how that works. Sometimes I don't get, I get sidetracked. Sometimes I don't get to where I need to go. But you know what? I never get in a hurry about the Word of God. I try not to because it's the Word that's going to keep you. It's the Word that is going to sustain you. It's the Word that is going to get, through, get you through whatever it is that you, that, that you face in life, okay? Counseling has its place. Worship has its place. Praise has its place. Prayer has its place. But it all has to be based in the Word. Jesus 
The Bible, the Bible says that many times the reason our prayers are not answered is why? Because we pray amiss. We don't pray according to the word. Okay, and the reason that sometimes our worship just seems like it falls flat is because we're not worshiping according to the word. We don't praise according to the word. We praise according to our tradition. We worship according to our tradition. We pray according to our tradition. Okay, and we, and, and, and we completely X the word out of what we're doing. Can you say amen? All right, so it's always important, always important, always first place, make sure what you're doing is word-based. You know, the Bible says that if two or three agree as touching anything, it shall be done unto them by my Father, which is in heaven. And the best person you can have agreeing with you, come on, is the Holy Spirit. Okay, so I always tell people, get a word and stand on that word, and that's the word you pray for the situation that you're in. Find a scripture that addresses what it is you're going through. Find a scripture that addresses the situation you're facing and stand on that scripture and put him in remembrance of his word. Okay? You got a rebellious child in your house? Put him in remembrance of his word. You're going through a financial difficulty? Put him in remembrance of his word. You're having a social situation? Put him in remembrance of his word. You're going through tribulation on your job? Put him in remembrance of his word. What does his word say? Amen? Praise the Lord. Sometimes we want counseling. When we don't need counseling, we need to dig into the word and find out what's going on. Uh-oh. Well, I, that done rocked your boat this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's get to our foundation scriptures, okay? I've meandered here long enough. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Matthew chapter 6. Verse 25, therefore I say unto you, take no thought, take no thought, take no thought, we're talking about thoughts, for your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on, is not life more than meat, and the body than raiment. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, notice that phrase, taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God can so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Verse 34. That take therefore no thought, no thought, thought, for tomorrow. For tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Okay. Go with me to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning at verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning at verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought, every thought, let me say that one more time, every thought unto the obedience of Christ. Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. 
in verse beginning at verse 16. Romans chapter 14, beginning at verse 16. Let not then your evil be your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God. Remember we talked about in Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first what? The kingdom, okay? For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. Sound familiar? But righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Thoughts, thoughts, thoughts. When Jesus talked about thoughts in Matthew chapter 6, he brought the kingdom into that situation. Okay? So, as we, as we learned a, few, a couple of weeks ago, our mind should be kingdom-minded. We are to take thoughts of the kingdom. We are to take thoughts of the kingdom. We are to be focused on the kingdom. So we talked about the righteousness of God. And what is the righteousness of God? The righteousness of God is God doing right. It's the rightness of God. And so we learn that because of his blood, we are righteous. It's the God way of doing things. It's the right way of doing things. And the first step in the kingdom is righteousness. Romans 14, 17 says what? It says that the kingdom of God is first righteousness, God's way of being right. Then it's peace. And then it's joy. And so what we want to minister on today is going to be the peace of God. Come on, the peace of God. Now let me give you a couple of Greek, de a Hebrew definition and a Greek definition here. Okay, and then I'm going, to, I'm going to remind some and introduce to others a principle of Bible study that, that you need to understand and you need to get this. Okay? In the Hebrew... The word peace, and we've all heard this, we, 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 if you've ever watched anything Jew, Jewish related or Israeli related, what's the greeting that everyone uses? Shalom. So that word peace in the Hebrew is the word shalom, but do we actually know what it means? And let me just say this, that shalom to the Orthodox Jew, okay, is both a greeting and a benediction. It's both a greeting and a, and a, and a benediction. When you meet uh, an Orthodox Jew, he is going to say, Shalom to you. Why does he say that? Because it has, we'll, as we will see in the scripture in just a little bit, he is making a declaration in your life. He may not understand what he's doing, but according to the scripture, he is actually declaring peace to you. And when he leaves you, he will say shalom again, which means he is leaving you with peace. But when we hear that word shalom, that word shalom, we need to understand something. And if you want to look it up, it's in your Strong's Concordance. Okay. It, it's the Greek word shalom, and the Hebrew word shalom, I'm sorry. And it's 7965 in your Greek concordance and in, in your Strong's Concordance. Okay. And it means to be safe. So when he says shalom, or when Christ declares peace to you, the first thing it means is you're safe. Okay, you ever watch a baseball game, and the runner comes running around the bases. Okay, and he slides into the, he slides into the base. He slides into home plate. The referee goes, you're safe. It means you can't be put out. Ah, come on now, all right? You need to understand you're safe in Christ, okay? It means to be well. That word well in the Hebrew actually means medicine, so it means to have medicine. It means to have, to be happy, okay? It means to have health. It means to have prosperity. So when when, when God pronounces shalom in your life, guess what? 
He is pronouncing healing to you. He's pronouncing prosperity to you. It means to have wholeness. Wholeness. Now, if you look into the Hamash, the Hebrew version of the concordance, so to speak, what the elders in, in the Hamash say is that a good working definition of the word shalom is to have nothing missing and nothing broken. Okay? Nothing missing and nothing broken. Now, let's go to the Greek. In the Greek, it's the Greek word. The number for the Greek word is 1515. Okay? And what it means is, it means, the, it, 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 it carries the meaning of prosperity. Okay? So when Christ, in John chapter 14, and we will see this in a minute, when he made the statement, my peace, I leave with you, my peace, I give you, and that word give in, in, in the Greek actually means to cast, it means he released it with no intention of bringing it back, okay? He was saying, prosperity be to you. Oh, now you're going to sound like a prosperity preacher. Yes, I am. Well, I sure don't want to be a poverty preacher. Come on. It means to have quietness. It means to have rest. Watch this. It means to set at one again. You know, sometimes if you break a bone, okay, you break your arm, you break your leg, they take you to the doctor, and the doctor has to reset that bone. In other words, he's got to put it back into place. And isn't it odd that the thing that helps you often causes you pain? I don't know if you've ever had a bone set back into place. I have. Okay? It's not fun. All right? It hurts. But after that initial pain, when that fracture heals, guess what? It's stronger than it was before, and it will never break in that place again. Isn't that, isn't that ironic? The thing that causes you pain is exactly what will never be broken again. That'll preach all by itself, folks. Okay? So it means to, it means to set at one. All right? Now... I told you I was going to teach you a Bible, a Bible study principle. Turn with me to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis, chapter 15. The book of Genesis, the 15th chapter. Beginning around the 15th verse. Let's look at something here. Actually, let's begin at verse 12. There's a principle in Bible study. When you study your Bible, it's called the law of first mention. Okay, whenever you're studying, especially a word, and I like to do word studies, okay, you always go to the Bible and you look to see where that word was first used. Oh, and it's a blessing, especially when you find it in the book of Genesis. Okay, all right. So the law of first mention, the first place we see this word shalom in the scripture is in Genesis 15, 15. But I want to begin at verse 12 because I want you to see what's going on. Okay? All right. Actually, let's back up just a little bit more. Uh, let me see here. How do I want to do this? Let me pray. Okay, yeah. Here's how we're going to do this. Okay? Let's, let, let, let's begin back at verse 9. Back at verse 9. And verse 9 says this, And he said unto him, this is God speaking to, Abra, speaking to Abram. Notice he's not speaking to Abraham yet. He's speaking to Abram. This is when he's going to make covenant with Abram. Okay? And he said unto him, Take me a heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Now let me just say this. You need to understand this because... This is going to show you type shadow of what Christ, of what Paul said, I'm sorry, what Paul said in the book of Hebrews, where he made the statement that because God could swear by no one else, he swore by himself. If you read this, you will find out that God actually makes covenant 
Not, not, not with Abraham, not with Abram, but he makes covenant with himself. Okay? He swears by himself, and Abram simply has to begin to walk and accept that covenant. All right? Okay, that's a study for another day. And he said unto him, Take me a heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid them each piece against one against the uh, one against another, but the birds he did not divide. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. In other words, he split the animals in half. He's cutting covenant, okay? And there's a responsibility in the covenant that the man has to keep the covenant from being contaminated, okay? He has to run the vultures away. He has to run the fowls of the air away, okay? And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, God said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. Okay? And also that nation whom they shall serve, I will judge, and afterwards they shall come out with great substance. That's the removal from Egypt. Okay? Watch this. The very first mention of Shalom. And you shall go to your fathers in Shalom. You shall be buried in a good old age. The very first mention of Shalom in the Bible is in connection with God making covenant with Abraham, with Abram. Okay? So we can extrapolate that and we need to understand, and I'll show you this from Scripture. We're going to, we're going to continue down this, down, down this vein. Okay? Shalom is in your covenant. Say that with me. Write that, that Type that out for me. Shalom is in my covenant. Shalom is in my covenant. Okay, write that. Hashtag that. Shucks, hashtag that. Post that. Put that on your Facebook page. Shalom is in my covenant. And remember what shalom means. Safe. Well. Happy. Healthy. Prosperous. Whole. Nothing missing, nothing broken. Amen? So, shalom is in my covenant. And we can understand that if shalom is in my covenant, when Jesus said, peace be unto you, that is in my covenant. Okay, we can understand that. So let's take this, let, let, let's kind of run with this. Now, let me explain something. Let me tell you, first of all, what peace is not. Because you see, the enemy loves to come in, okay, and take the word of God and twist it. That's what he did with Eve. That's what he's done all through the ages. That's what he tries to do in our lives now. He tries to take the word of God and twist it, okay? So, there are some of you that are sitting here today. Excuse me just a second. There are some of you who are sitting here and you're about three minutes into this message and already what you're thinking in your mind, well, I got this tribulation in my life. I got this trial in my life. I got this obstacle in my life. So I must not be walking in covenant with God and I don't have peace. So let me tell you what peace is not. Okay? Okay. Peace is not the absence of situations. Just because you're going through a situation does not mean you do not have peace. Let me say that again. Just because you're going through a situation does not mean you're not at peace. Peace is not the absence of trouble. The Bible says in this world, what? You will have, come on, tribulation. 
Why would Jesus promise you his peace and then turn right around and say you will have tribulation? Peace is not the absence of trials. So we don't measure our peace by the way our life is going. The blessedness of peace is that in the midst of a situation, ah, I'm going to show you this, in the midst of a trial, in the midst of a temptation, in the midst of what I'm walking through, I am at peace. Because you see, peace is a weapon, and you're going to see that in just a couple of minutes. Okay? The kingdom of God is what? Righteousness. Peace is a weapon. Righteousness is a weapon. Righteousness is what carries me. Okay? Peace is a weapon. So is joy. I can't wait till I get to joy. I'm going to show you how joy was the weapon that Christ used to go through the cross. Come on. Okay? So we don't measure our peace by what we're going through. Our peace is measured why, while we are in the midst of these things. And I'm going to show you that in Scripture, okay? Turn with me to the book of John, chapter 14. The Gospel of John, the 14th chapter. Let's get into some Scripture here. And we're going to move kind of quickly. But I'm not going to move so quickly that we don't get what we need to get here. John chapter 14. John, the 14th chapter. And where do I want to begin here? Let me see. Let's begin at verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now let's stop here for a second. We had a blessed time yesterday with Brother Jonas. But one thing, Brother Jonas is a preaching machine. Okay? He don't miss an opportunity to share the word. Hallelujah. And so he, he, we would stop frequently yesterday just so we could get little nuggets. And I want you to know it was a blessed time. It was good stuff. Amen. And so one of the things that he shared was that the day that his house burned, he was standing outside and one of his members came. They had heard about what had happened. They came by the house and... Jonas is just standing outside, and the guy asked him, he says, what happened? Jonas raised his hands in the air, and he says, the Lord has given me a burnt offering. And that's exactly what he's done. He's offered that burnt house back to the Lord, okay? And God has taught him so much through this situation, so much through walking through this situation, okay? But he's at peace. In the midst of losing his house, losing everything in the house, they don't even have pictures of what the house looked like. They lost everything. Cell phones, the whole night, all the photos. Stuff that he's gathered from traveling around the world. Everything he owned, gone. Okay, in space of an hour. Okay, but yet he's at peace. Okay, and he's still walking through that situation. How many of y'all want to walk through a situation okay sometimes God doesn't remove you from the situation but he gives you the grace to walk through it so watch this if you love me you'll keep my commandments notice that the commandments are not being kept because I have to ah see that's where we mess up a lot of times we think we have to do something to please God no 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 I keep, I do what God says, not because I have to, but because I love him. His agape produces, the, produces my obedience. Remember, I, saw, I told you this last a couple of weeks ago. What does faith produce? Faith always produces obedience. Okay? 
Agape carries me that way. Agape is what everything, faith worked by love. So I can also say that love produces obedience, okay? I pride myself on as I got older, my daddy, unless he absolutely wanted to and didn't tell me he was going to do it, never touched a lawnmower because I'd always make time to go there and cut the grass for him. I'd always try to make time and go by the house and take care of what I needed and, and take care of what needed to be done. Not because I had to. Nobody had a rule there. Okay, but it's because I wanted to. I think I'm the only guy that 20-something years old, I voluntarily had a curfew of midnight. I could stay out all, all night if I wanted to. I'm not a grown man. Okay? But out of respect and out of love for my parents, if I was going to be out past midnight, I always called them and I let them know that I was going to be out. I let them know where I was going to be, let them know what I was going to be doing. Okay? Why? Because I respected them and I loved them. You see, love produces honor. Love produces respect. Love will produce obedience. Amen? Okay? i got a little sidetracked there. I apologize. Okay? But if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall send you another paraclete. He will send you another paraclete. Now, let me give you the definition of that word paraclete. Okay? It comes from the Greek word parakletos. And it means advocate. Advocate. What is an advocate? An advocate is someone who stands in your stead and pleads your case before the judge. Okay? It means intercessor. Okay? It's someone who prays and intervenes. But it also means counselor. So in other words, the Holy Spirit will plead your case before the Father through Christ. Okay? And he'll also come beside you and give you comfort in the midst of your storm. So you see, because I have the comforter, I don't have to be concerned when I'm going through the tribulation. I don't have to be concerned when I'm going through the situation. I don't have to be concerned when I'm facing a trial. Why? Because I know the comforter that comes to me is also advocating my, my case before the Father. Do you see it? I know he's advocating my case before the Father. Isn't that a blessing? We understand that, okay? So, understand what's going on in John chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14, 15, 16, and 17. Understand what's going on. Jesus has just made an announcement that he is going to be leaving them. He's going to be crucified. He's going to die. He's letting them know what's going on. He's letting them know that someone's going to betray him. Okay? And so in the midst of all this, what did the disciples do? They begin to struggle. They begin to debate, number one, who's going to be the betrayer. But then they also begin to debate who is going to be in charge when Jesus leaves. Okay? They want to know who's going to be in charge. They want to know who's going to sit at his right hand. They want to know who's going to be the top dog. They want to know who's taking over the Jesus Christ Evangelistic Association. Okay? And Jesus diverts their thoughts and diverts their attention away from that to bring them to something that is more important, and that is to understand that there's going to be a comforter that's going to come and then he makes this statement, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, because he dwell, he, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Okay, come on down to verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. 
Watch this. Watch verse 27. Peace. Shalom. Actually, it's the Greek word that he uses, but it carries the same meaning. Peace. I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, let not your spirit be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now, I want you to see something here. Jesus is laying out the end of his earthly ministry. And he is leaving them instructions on how they will be able to continue his ministry after he dies, after he is buried, and after he is resurrected. And they, they completely miss it. They're focused right here. Okay, let me, help, let me help you out. They're focused right there. If you put your hand in front of your face, okay, try to see around your hand. You really can't. Okay, you can't see the whole picture. The disciples here are not seeing the whole picture. They're focused on the fact that Christ is leaving. Okay? And as long as you're focused on what is right in front of you, you'll never walk in his peace and you'll never walk in his comfort. You've got to look around and you've got to see the whole picture. You've got to understand, okay, and I'm going to show you this in just a couple of minutes, You've got to understand that the comforter has your best interests in mind and that he is walking you through a process for a purpose that's bigger than you. Let me say that again. He is walking you through a process that is bigger than you. Okay? So you can't be focused on you. You've got to be focused on the kingdom. You've got to be focused on what his word says. You've got to be focused on the leading of the Holy Ghost. You've got to be focused on what Christ is doing in you. Come on. All right? So the Holy Spirit is there. The Comforter is there. Not just to make you feel good. Not just so you can shout out a ya ya kickstart the Hyundai. Not just so you can get goosebumps and run around the church. And not just so you can raise your hands and shout and worship and feel good. Okay, which is all fine. It's all good stuff. But the Holy Spirit is in our lives to do what? To teach us how to live this Christian life. And what does he say? Okay, in verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. And we forget this. Because we're so interested in how we feel and what's going on in my life that we forget the main, the main purpose, the main ministry of the Holy Spirit is to do what? To change us and bring His Word to us and make it alive so that the Word becomes flesh so that we get changed. You see, the problem is we got so many believers today. They're believers but they're not disciples. They don't want to be changed. We don't want to be changed. I want to do things the way I did it last year. I want to do things the way I did it two years ago. I want to do it the way I did it three months ago. Now, I made this statement one time to, our, to, to Waters of Hope, I, I, probably about a year or so ago. If your prayer language hasn't changed, there's something wrong with you. You know, my grandson, Micah Jr., there was a time that all he could do was go babbity 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 babbity. Okay? Now, guess what? There a day came where he was able to go babbity 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 dodo. Or babbity 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 momo. Okay? So he his speech began to change. Why? Because he was getting older. Well, now he can put sentences together. Why? Because he's getting older older. And I'm just going to go out and I'm going to say this. My brother, my sister, if you're still going, ba -ba 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 -ba, sha -da 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 -da, sha -da 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 -da, and then nothing's changed in your prayer language, I wonder about your maturity in Christ. Oh, my God. 
Say amen, say ouch. Okay? If you're still if you're still praying the way in tongues the way you prayed a year ago, there's something wrong. You should be maturing. You should be holding dialogue. You should be holding dialogue with the Holy Ghost. With, 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 with God. Okay? I can really mess you up. You can talk in tongues to somebody you're ministering with and they'll get the interpretation in their spirit and you don't ever have to speak in English. Oh, that's a, that, that's a story for another day. Okay? All right? Yeah, buddy. I'm gonna, I'm, let, let, let me just stop right there. I'm going to go on. Okay? So, he said he would send you a comforter. Watch what that, that and, and so that comforter is the one who makes the word of God alive to us. He's the one that turns the logos into rhema. Remember, logos is the general word of God, the written word. But then we have the speaking word, the, the rhema of God. It's the quickening word. That's where the word now becomes flesh. Can you say amen? John chapter 1, around the 12th verse, says what? And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, you know, the Bible says that you're a city, you're a light that is set on a hill. Okay? Isaiah 61 says, Arise, shine! Well, what are you going to shine? You're going to shine because of the rhema in your life. The rhema will make your light shine. Come on. Hallelujah. All right? So, we need to understand that the Holy Spirit will bring the peace of God through His Word. Okay? Let me give you... I'm a, and, and, and we're almost, we're almost, I, 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 I want to hurry here. Let me give you... Just a couple of principles of what peace is. Okay? We need to understand that the Holy Spirit wants to bring peace to us. And He brings peace to us by the quickening of His Word. And so we understand that righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost is the kingdom. Do we understand? Do we get that? Okay? So number one, peace. Let me drop this to you. Peace is a declaration. Turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. Mark, chapter 5. Mark, chapter 5. And I want you to see, beginning at verse 25. Mark, chapter 5, beginning at verse 25. And a certain woman, notice it wasn't a woman. It's not a parable. He's talking about a certain person. Everybody knew who this woman was, who had an issue of blood 12 years and it suffered many things of many physicians, and it spent all that she had. That's important because remember what peace is. Okay, remember what that word peace means. Nothing missing, nothing broken. And it, and, was, and it spent all that she had and was none better, but rather grew worse. And when she had heard of Jesus, when she heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. Notice she didn't say she shall be healed. She said she shall be whole. Okay. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And the disciples said unto him, Man, you got you know, you ever feel clueless? You know, I'm just, even if you feel clueless sometime, there's hope for you. Okay, the disciples were clueless. All right? And his disciples said unto him, You see the multitude thronging you. And you say, who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell before him and told him all the truth. Now we got it. They had, they had a dialogue. This probably took 10, 15 minutes. Okay. And he, 
He who, Jesus, said unto her, Daughter, your faith have made you whole. Look at the next words. Go in peace. I want you to get the, I want you to get the picture of that. When he said go in peace, he made a declaration. So when he said go in peace, he's telling her to go in prosperity. He's telling her to go in quietness. He's telling her to go in rest. He's telling her to be set at one again. Now notice this. She is a daughter of Abraham. Okay? She's a daughter of Abraham. So she has the right to the covenant that God made with Abram. And the first one of the things in that covenant was what? Shalom. Nothing missing. Nothing broken. So, why does he pronounce shalom on her? Okay? Because she spent all her money. So she needed prosperity in her life. She was ridiculed by the town, by the other people in the town. So she needed quietness. She needed rest. She needed the shalom, the, and the Greek word behind it. She needed what peace meant. So Jesus makes the declaration of peace over her. Can I show you another scripture? And I won't go, I won't turn to it. You can write this down. In Luke chapter 24, verse 36, when Jesus appears to them after his resurrection, they were affrighted, the scripture says, they were scared. Okay, they were scared. And Jesus says, What? Peace unto you. I want you to know something. When you're going through something, it's okay to say peace. Over your life. It's okay to declare peace over your life. It's okay to declare peace into someone else's life. We need to be declaring peace instead of always trying to prove our position and prove our doctrine and prove whatever. We should be declaring peace to other people and we need to declare it over ourselves. Amen? Peace. I declare peace to you today. Stop fretting on how your needs are going to be met. I declare peace to you today. Stop trying to fix things on your own. I declare peace to you today. Stop trying to work out your situation on your own with your own mind, your own intellect. Peace. Shalom. Nothing missing. Nothing broken. Amen. Let's walk, let's walk through this. Come on, turn with me to the book of Romans and we'll close here. The book of Romans, chapter 5. Book of Romans, chapter 5. How many people will give me 10 minutes? Hallelujah. Well, I'm going to take 10 minutes anyway. You're not here to shut me down. <laughs> Therefore, beginning at verse 1, Romans 5, 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have, say it with me, type it out, Peace with God by faith through our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, it's through Christ. So you see now the responsibility is taken off of me. Okay? I'm not the one who enforces the covenant. I'm the one who walks in the covenant. By whom we also have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Peace comes by grace. It comes by Christ. Now, if he has already declared it over me, if he has already given it to me by his grace, if I already have it because of his covenant that he cut at Calvary, then guess what? I walk in it. Peace is already mine. It's my responsibility to add, it's my responsibility to administer that peace. Come on. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation. Let's talk, oh, now we're going to walk something. Peace is my weapon. Say that. Peace is my weapon. It's my declaration. Number two, peace is my weapon. I'm going to use my, the weapons of my warfare. So, 
I'm walking in peace. I have peace. I have peace. Nothing missing, nothing broken. With God, through Christ our Lord. And so the first thing I see is, is that I'm going to glory in tribulation. What does that word tribulation mean in the Greek? We're going to move quickly. That word tribulation in the Greek means pressure. 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 Okay? God is going to allow pressure to come. Okay? Because it's in the pressure that other things begin to happen. Remember I told you that peace is not the absence of trials and tribulations, situations, etc. But my peace is measured in the midst of what I walk through. Okay? Let me just say this. You need to be steady. You need to be steady. You need to not be ruled by your emotions, but you need to be ruled by God's Word. You need to have in front of you what God's Word says, and no matter what is going on, you need to understand that God's Word carries you through and is in the forefront. Okay, Your focus needs to be on the Word. So, tribulation means pressure. So when the pressure comes, the pressure is going to produce something in my life. It's going to produce patience. Look what the scripture says. Let's walk. Knowing that tribulation worketh. That word worketh means to produce. It means to cause to happen. That word patience, it tribulation Pressure is going to produce patience. What is patience? What is patience? Patience is not just sitting back, oh, whatever will be, will be, que sera, sera. Okay, that's not what patience is. Patience is consistency. Patience is consistency. So you see, when the pressure comes, the pushing on me, what everybody else should see, is my consistency in staying focused on the Word, staying focused on who God is, staying focused knowing that God is going to carry me through. I don't run around wondering, oh, I just don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's happening in my life. I just don't know how I'm going to make it through. No, 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 no. Consistency, patience tells me that I know God is on my side. Now, he's not blessing my mess, but he's on my side because I'm his child and I know he's got me. All right? So patience I'm sorry, tribulation produces patience that everybody sees. And I continuously confess God is on my side. And I don't get rattled. I don't get murmuring. I don't get complaining. I don't sit there and wonder, oh, the economy is going to hell in a handbasket. Nope. It may be going to hell in a handbasket for you, but my God supplies all of my need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Amen? So patience produces experience. Do you see how these things begin to work together? You see, so many times we oppose the principles of God instead of working with the principles of God. Okay? So consistency produces what is called experience. So when I looked up the Greek word experience in Scripture, I looked it up and it had a unique word that I really didn't know the definition of. It's called trustiness. T-R-U-S-T-I-N-E-S-S. -S, trustiness. So I went to my Webster's 1828 dictionary and I looked up the word trustiness. And it says this. Here's the definition. That quality of a person 
by which he deserves. Oh, let me just stop right there for a second. Does God deserve something from you today? Ah, that quality of a person by which he deserves the confidence of others. Can I challenge you? How many of us have confidence that God will do what he says he'll do? My God. How many of us have the confidence that his word will never fail? That his word will always work? That his word will carry me through anything? Confidence. And then in, 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 in the definition, it means faithfulness. Not faith, faithfulness. Isn't it interesting that one of the fruit of the Spirit spoken of in Galatians 5 is faithfulness? Okay, we'll see that in just a second. I want you to know today that if you will operate in the principles of God, and allow him to have his perfect work in you. He will be faithful to you. He's faithful and willing to work in your life. He's faithful. Okay? And then that faithfulness produces hope. Now, we know the definition of hope from our foundation class. What is it? It means a determined in an anticipated in it's my destination the word is taking me somewhere so where is the word taking me okay what is the scripture that i'm standing on that produces the peace of god in my life that produces the righteousness of god in my life that produces the joy of god in my life that produces my needs met in my life. What is the scripture that I'm standing on? I am standing on the scripture that is going to bring me to where God wants me to be. Amen? Do you see it? So I'm not concerned about my needs being met because I've, I'm decreeing it and I'm declaring it. I'm not concerned about if God is going to heal me because he's already healed me. I'm not concerned about how I'm going to make it through a situation because he's already said he will bring me through the situation. Amen? Okay, number three. And I can't, I can't teach this message without this scripture because it is one of Apostle Barber's favorite scriptures. Um, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 15. Watch this. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. Peace is my declaration. Peace is my weapon. Number three, peace is my governor. Peace is my governor. Colossians chapter 3. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ, remember when you see that word Christ, who is he talking about? It's either, it's talking about Jesus, it can be talking about the anointing, it can be talking about all three, so you need to pray and meditate. Is it talking about Jesus? Is it talking about the anointing? Or is it talking about Jesus and the anointing? Okay, so let the word of Christ Dwell in you richly, abundantly, prosperous in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Peace is your governor. Apostle Barber puts it like this. I follow my peace bubble. Okay? If you begin to move in something and you don't have peace about it, you don't move in it. 
But even, in the, even when it doesn't look right, even when it doesn't seem right, the peace of God will override that, and, and you'll get this settling in your spirit, man. And you know what's right. So you follow your peace. Okay? Can I leave you with one more scripture? And I'll close here, I promise. This will be my last scripture, I'll close. But let me tell you what that word rule means very quickly. It means to arbitrate. You know, when two, in, in, a, in, in a civil trial, if two opposing factions agree to binding arbitration, that means they have agreed not to go to a judge, and they've agreed to have an arbitrator come in and settle the, settle the dispute, usually a financial dispute. And the word of the arbitrator is final. Okay? It means to arbitrate. It means to govern. I like this last definition. It means to umpire. Okay? So when the umpire says you're safe at home plate, nobody else can argue about it. Okay? You're safe. Can I say something to you? That the peace of God tells you when you're safe. The peace of God arbitrates for you. The peace of God governs your life. Amen. Let me leave you one more scripture. Galatians chapter 5. Last scripture, I promise. Galatians chapter 5. Going to a very familiar verse of scripture. Galatians chapter 5. In verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, agape, joy, peace, 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 nothing missing, nothing broken, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. That word faith there is actually faithfulness, trustiness, remember that word trustiness, faithfulness, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Okay? God wants to cultivate the fruit of peace in your life. Let me say that again. God wants to cultivate the fruit of peace in your life. The reason you walk through situations, the reason you walk through trials, is because God is cultivating peace in your life. He's bringing peace to the forefront because peace is one of the evidences of the kingdom of God. Not just righteousness, but peace. Nothing missing, nothing broken. Wholeness, wellness, prosperity, the peace of God rules in our lives. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for who you are. Now, Father, I make a declaration today. I declare peace in the lives of the members of Waters of Hope International Ministries. I speak peace to the people listening to this broadcast. I speak peace to those who will rehear this broadcast. I speak peace to the people around the world who will listen to this word. And we declare the kingdom of God, his righteousness, his peace, and his joy will live in them today. You know, Pastor James brought out something in Bible study last week, well, Wednesday a week ago, and I didn't realize it. But you know, the Bible says that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached for a witness and then shall the end come we need to declare the kingdom there's a world out there my brother and my sister that needs peace you need to declare peace you need to tell them stop running from God because only in God will they have peace. Or you can try to placate their peace by buying them stuff and giving them food, giving them money, okay, contributing to their cause. 
But at the end of the day, you need to declare peace. Nothing missing. Nothing broken. Jesus didn't stop with the woman of the issue of blood at healing her. He said, go in peace. Amen? We love you guys. Be blessed. Don't forget your tithes and offerings today. Don't forget to share this message on your timeline. Don't forget to be a messenger of the kingdom of God. We love y'all. Be blessed. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.